So, how many of you here, you want to get rich? <laughs> if you are, you have come to the wrong place. <laughs> well, let me give you a little bit of uh, statistics here. So, I did some research, and according to a recent survey, an increasing number of churchgoers believe that God wants all believers to be healthy, wealthy, and successful. In fact, about three out of four churchgoers strongly agree that God wants them to be financially prosperous. They are convinced that not only did Jesus die on the cross to pay for our sins, but also for us to be wealthy and successful. And for the most part, those people who teach these things have questionable intentions, especially when there's a lot of money involved. Believe it or not, such sketchy teachers are discussed in the Bible, and they go all the way back to about 3,500 years ago, in the time of Moses. So please rise, we'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 13b to 16. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression, as speechless donkeys spoke with human voice, and restrained the prophet's madness. Our Heavenly Father, you said that you are the one who gives us the ability to produce wealth. And when we have that, we should remember you as its source. Indeed, you have blessed us in ways we couldn't even imagine. But the thing is, the more we have, the more unsatisfied we become. And that's a problem. So today, remind us to learn to be content, to be satisfied, and to find our hope in you and not in money. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. False Teachers Unmasked, Part 4, The Way of Balaam. So in last week's sermon, we learned that false teachers are notorious for their refusal to submit to authority. May that be God's authority or human authority or the church's authority. These people, they do not want to subject themselves to it. And second, false teachers are walking straight to their eternal doom. There's no escaping the truth. They will suffer an eternity of pain and grief and shame in hell unless they repent of their sins and put their trust in the Lord Jesus. So in today's sermon, we will discover a common issue associated with false teachers that shows what actually motivates them to do what they do. Two parts that will be the division of today's message, beginning with verses 13b to 14. Masters of avarice. Big word right there. It's just, it's just a fancy way of saying greed. Now, Peter further exposes the false teacher's evil acts. While these religious hacks pose as spiritual leaders with some special knowledge from God, their open sinning is on full display. They're not ashamed of doing these evil, evil activities. In fact, they even perform these things in broad daylight. And Peter says they are reveling in their pleasures. Now, because of the shame involved, uncontrollable parties are often done in, in the dark of night. But these false teachers rave in broad daylight which shows us how shameful they have become. Now, what makes these acts even more 
shocking is that the false teachers participate in the love feasts of the church. Now, traditionally, the communion, what we do here every second Sunday of the month, it was an actual meal shared amongst the believers, rich and poor. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see a whole passage describing how the church back then conducted their communion. Very much different from how we do it these days, but I think we should go all the way back to that passage and see if we are doing it right or not. So, Peter describes them as blots and blemishes. He's not talking about pimples or acne, but he is talking about them being spiritual imposters, bringing nothing but shame to the name of the Lord Jesus. These men, they take pleasure in excessive eating and drinking. Therefore, their deeds are unsightly, unfit for anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus, let alone a teacher of the gospel. Now, these false teachers likely attended meals with believers. And like what I said, they probably attended communion services and basically turned those those sacred holy gatherings into wild parties. Instead of being mindful of others, they selfishly indulged themselves in binge eating and having wild nights of drunkenness. Dipsomania. Now in verse 14, Peter describes them as men that have eyes full of adultery. That's a very vivid way of describing their, their tendencies to commit adultery. For example, they made every woman a subject or object of their sexual fantasies. You will see the same thing in John, in the book of 2 John and the book of Jude. They tell you the same exact story. In other words, their eyes are always looking for sin. And this is shown by the fact that they entice unsteady souls. Unsteady souls meaning uh, people who have no deep spiritual biblical foundation. Now I want to talk a little bit about the word Entice, did he use the word entice there? Yeah, entice. In the Greek, this word finds its roots in the world of hunting and fishing, which, uh, which suggests that somebody is using a bait to lure a fish into the hook or, or a, a wild animal, a game animal, into the trap. But eventually, this word... Um, had a little bit of a, an editing in its meaning, and it became used to refer to moral temptation. Now, perhaps they misuse Scripture to justify their sinning or teach that there is nothing wrong about these shameful acts if they did them in love. Now, the spiritually immature of that time are, we're convinced that if religious leaders were doing such things, those wild parties, those uncontrollable drinking parties, then it should be acceptable for other people, for other believers, younger believers, to do the same. And then Peter further reveals that these men have hearts trained in greed. Now, they are not newbies, they're not trainees, but they are masters in greed. They are very well versed in the art of deception and avarice. Now, the Greek term for greed, or the word trained, the Greek term suggests a long and hard and exhaustive training in a particular discipline. In this case, greed, meaning these false teachers have spent many years practicing covetousness and have now become masters at it. And because of this, Peter calls them accursed children. In other translations, you will find the term children of the curse. 
That's basically his declaration of the false teacher's ultimate doom. First point for today, false teachers are greedy, adulterous religious posers. I want to focus on one thing though, covetousness. Now, covetousness is not a simple sin. It is a serious one. As a matter of fact, it is one of the Ten Commandments, showing us how serious it is and how God actually hates this sin. But what is covetousness to begin with? First, from a secular perspective, it simply means not being satisfied with with anything. It's about having the desire to accumulate more, to get more and more and more. However, the Bible describes it a little bit differently. It has a more comprehensive meaning. Not only does it involve um, a desire for material possession, but also an uncontrolled, unbridled lust for sex and other lustful activities. Now, Scripture connects covetousness to other evils such as murder, adultery, even slander, and lying. Now, all of these things, things that I just mentioned, are found in the false teachers that Peter is describing in this whole passage. Now, throughout the ages, countless religious leaders have fallen from grace. And our generation is no, example, is no, exception, no exception. But, like what I said in our first meeting, the first message in this series, I said I will not mention any names. It is up to you to Google, and I'm sure you will find plenty of names. Now, and most of the names that you will find in are guilty of things that are related to power, wealth, and women. A lot of preachers and pastors and even motivational speakers and even apologists. Just fairly recently, a big name in the apologetics world, just right after his death, his his sexual um, sins were, were revealed. I don't want to mention names, but uh, he was pretty instrumental in training a lot of young Christians in apologetics, teaching us how to defend the Christian faith. But you hear things like that, you feel sorry for them. Now, most often than not, these people do not hold themselves accountable to anyone. Like what we, we've learned last week, they equate their words with Scripture. That's why you have cults. You have religious groups these days that instead of using the Bible, they come up with their own traditions. And they follow those traditions instead. Now, because of their hold on people, no one dared to question their teachings or their actions. In our country, the Philippines is replete with such people. You can find any municipality or city and there should be a cult in in those places, sometimes more than one. Go up on the mountains, you will find more cults with leaders abusing people, especially young girls. But their greed and their hunger for power is only going to get worse. In the process, they're destroying not only themselves, but all those around them. But along with their downfall, they also caused many to reject Christianity and turn their backs on the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people attended healing crusades only to be discriminated because their disease was non-treatable. And now those people hate God because of the examples given by those false healers and teachers. As such, they have brought nothing but shame 
and a reproach on the church, and more specifically, to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But this message is not just about false teachers. It is my intention to search our, to search our hearts, to ask God to search them. Because every human being can be found guilty of these things, including us. We're not excused from this. Besides the obvious desire for whatever others, whatever other, other people possess, we can, own, we can also be found guilty of covetousness in many other ways, like in physical appearance, like our career achievements, like the things that we own, like our social status, our, our educational accomplishments, and sometimes, mind you, even spiritual gifts. We can find others more appealing and we won't just want to be like them. We want to be like them. So, let's consider the Bible's warning against covetousness. Ephesians 5, 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So I want to zoom in on the two things that are discussed in this passage. Sexual immorality and greed, the desire to have more. How do we avoid falling into the same pattern? How do we avoid being controlled by those sins? I have a suggestion. And anyone can do it. I think the first thing that we all need to do is to remind ourselves that these sins, again, sexual immorality and greed, often come from a place of discontentment. We're just unhappy. We don't feel satisfied with who we are, with what we have and who we're with. That's why we try to find things or people to kind of fill that void. That's why we have broken marriages. That's why we have corruption issues and things like that. But if we learn to be thankful for what we have, I think we'll do good. This is the, the lesson that, I, that God has been teaching me for years. Be content, be content, be happy with what you have. Because I find it so easy to be lured into, into the idea of getting more means you are more blessed. Like getting the latest 2024 John Deere tractor. I don't know what it's named. Wait, I, I actually looked it up. Let, let, let me, yeah, I looked it up. It's, it's, it's something with an R and a number nine. <laughs> and you can buy it at, in Dawson Creek for $923,000 used. <laughs> That's used. Yeah. Yeah, so my suggestion is this. Learn how to be content. It always works. Because things are, chances are, you buy the latest thing now, another one will be released next year. And now yours is used and old and, dep and depreciated. It's not going to go up in value. It always goes down. And, you, and in, in, as a result, you remain unhappy. Unhappy then, unhappy now. You will always be unhappy. So learn to be thankful. I'm talking to myself. Learn to be thankful and be content. Because thankfulness puts God on the spotlight, not us. And here's my case. My argument is this. When we are out busy being grateful, we won't have much time being bitter and grabby. Don't get me wrong. There are times when we really need to buy stuff. And I'm referring to those 
moments when there's nothing else you can do about it. You just have to buy. That's why you work, right? And earn an honest living to buy things to help yourself, your family, and those around you. But trying to accumulate things for the purpose of collecting them and finding your joy and satisfaction in watching, watching them grow, your collection grows. I've seen a, a, a man, a man my age, who began collecting McDonald's toys from Happy Meals for 25 years, and he built an entire house for his toys. Don't look at me that you don't have that thing too. We all have that. If we only had the, the cash, we would do the same thing. That's why here in, 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 this, in this moment, God is reminding us, put that off. Cut it off. Stop that. Learn to be content. Learn to be grateful. That goes for me. That goes for you. Verses 15 and 16, spiritual mercenaries. Now, to further make his point, Peter uses another illustration. And this time, he brings up an Old Testament false prophet named Balaam, or Balaam in Hebrew. Perhaps to compare the false teachers of, of the diaspora, the first century Christian scene. Now, Balaam was a native of a place called Pithor, or Pethor, a city in Mesopotamia, which is in modern-day modern Iraq. And he was blessed by Yahweh with prophetic power. But he was hired by Balak, the king of the Midian, or the Moab, Moabites, to curse the Israelites. So Balak knew that Balaam, or, or Balaam, could be influenced by the love of money and, or gold. So he paid him off to curse the Israelites. While Balaam did not really take the gold, the money, he still had the desire for it. However, he was compelled by God to bless the Israelites himself, or to, to bless the Israelites instead. And this account is found in Numbers chapters 22 to 24. Now, going back to the false prophets, like Balaam, who refused to follow the right way, the false teachers of Peter's time have gone astray. Now, this is interesting because the Greek word that Peter used to describe the falling away of, the, of these false teachers is the same Greek word for the word planet. Planet, a wandering heavenly body. That's where we get our, our word planet from. Pla, planao in, in, in Greek. Now, the false teachers' continued deviation from the right way led them to lose their way completely. And what makes this worse is that they, they, dr they have drifted too far and have gone past the point of return. So there was no way for these men to go back to, or to, uh, to, be, to repent of their sins and turn to God. Kind of like what happened to Judas. Kind of like what happened to King Saul of Israel. There's that point in life when God just gives a person a way up. God gives them up to their depravity, to their sinning. Only, only for them to realize that they have been destroying themselves all along. Balaam was well aware that God was determined to bless Israel and to curse those who cursed them. However, his love of money, Balaam's love of money, drove him to deceive the people of Israel. And when you read Numbers 31, you will find out that Balaam indulged or enticed the Israelites to indulge in sexual sins. And that, that decision essentially removed God's protection over Israel. And because of his treachery, Balaam was killed by the Israelites during their quest of Midian. That's found in Numbers 31 verse 8. 
And what he did was really, really evil. By separating Israel from God's protection and blessing, his wickedness actually caused greater disaster, greater harm to the Israelites than those who attacked them directly. So that gives us an idea that God's protection, when that is taken away from us, we will be more vulnerable, we will be more susceptible to defeat than being actually confronted by evil, by enemies. Now in verse 16, Peter picks another episode in Balaam's life to show God's rebuke of wickedness. Now in his attempt to kind of curse the Israelites for money, God caused a speechless donkey to talk and rebuke this false prophet. And this scene is probably why when it comes to the Israelites, you know, they consider Balaam as the most, the most horrible person, the most foolish of men. Now, the false teacher's madness is just as bad as Balaam's, specifically when you think of, when you think of how a donkey spoke like a human being to rebuke a man who is supposed to be a religious leader. But despite God's warning and the donkey's rebuke, Balaam's desire for gold was stronger, causing the Israelites to sin, and so he eventually perished. He was killed. Last point for today. False teachers are motivated by their love of money. I have a question. Why do you think does the New Testament talk a whole lot about false teachers? Jesus, Paul, James, Peter, Jude, John, all of these, these people said or wrote something against false teachers. And why does it mean that money is their main focus in their operations? Why is there always money involved in their operations? Obviously, you need money to, to pay for the bills, but why is money always the highlight of their messages? Because according to the Bible, false teachers think that godliness is a means of gain. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So to them, preaching and establishing yourself as a preacher or a teacher of the Bible was a means of getting rich quick. Lee, adverb. And now, today's false teachers are not very different from Balaam. They're not very different from the false teachers of Peter's time. Different generation, same tactics. Their main message is always about money. Teaching that living for God will result in a financially stable and abundant life. Friends, I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who wants to be rich using the Bible, but that is a big lie. When you think of Jesus, what was he? A carpenter. A carpenter who did not have his own house. So when the taxation agency would, would ask him for his address, he couldn't give anything. He didn't have a home of his own. And that's the God, that's the Lord that we are following, right? And if we are, if we are truly following him, and then we really don't have any business trying to get rich and allowing ourselves to be distracted by money and earthly possessions. What did he say? 
to that rich young ruler or to anyone who wanted to follow him for that matter. If you really want to follow me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. A lot of people these days are nothing but ear ticklers. They will say things that you want to hear. Because when you feel good about what you hear, you tend to give more. I'm not going to be surprised if our collection will be down this whole five-week series. Because yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to give to a pastor who, huh, who condemns the love of money. Some false teachers teach that God wills that his, his people to live in abundance. And they quote Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. I only have one, one simple question to ask. How sure are you that that's for Christians? Isn't Jeremiah 29 about God's promises to the Israelites who are about to be sent into exile in Babylon for 70 years? And each time I ask that question, it couldn't give me any answer. They take the Bible out of context because they saw a tiny little opportunity to use that verse to entice people to believe and give more in order to receive more. Oh, here we go. I found it. Some false teachers emphasize speaking words of faith as a way to manifest health, wealth, and success. Like, I manifest owning a brand new John Deere 9RX590. That's the one. $950,000 before tax. In BC, 12%. And you can buy that. In Dawson Creek. Manifest. I hear that word a lot today. Because that's what you hear when you hear, when you listen to Christian, modern Christian songs. You hear that word a lot. Manifest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manifest my college diploma. I'm going to manifest my, my, my new phone, my new car. Yada, yada, yada. If you hear a, a preacher that entices you to dream about things instead of going deeper in your walk with Christ, you got to wake up from your delusion. Stop listening to that person and read your Bible for yourself and learn it yourself. Don't listen to me. I'm not asking anyone to believe me. What I'm asking for is for everyone who does listen to me to check if, I'm, if what I'm teaching is true or a lie. It is up to you. Don't believe me. Believe what the Bible says and see it for yourself. Again, today's passage tells us, my friends, that having that deep-seated desire to become rich can be very dangerous. Because when we are obsessed with wealth, we could resort to dishonest, unbiblical methods, like deceiving people, not being honest with the way we do business. But even when prosperity is not our goal, believing that our giving is a means of gaining God's approval, like I'm going to give this much today because I want God to give me so I could buy this thing. If that is your mindset towards giving, I'm telling you this. Don't give. Keep your money to yourself. Buy something else. Do not give to this church. If your purpose is for you to be blessed by God greatly so that you can, you can buy whatever you want. Giving is not investing. I reject that teaching. We don't give because we want to receive. We give because it's an act of worship. 
We give because we know that we are nothing but stewards of God's wealth. We give because we know that it is God who gives us the ability to produce wealth in the, in the first place. We only give, we know, through our sacrificial giving, we are killing our selfishness and our desire to have more. It is an act of turning away from our sins and entrusting God our future and our family. 